the cloud. The next thing is my opportunity here to introduce our president and CEO, uh, Mr. Nick Penizzato, who Nick, a uh, fellow Pennsylvanian like me, will be at the Habitat module here in a few weeks. So uh, Nick, uh, I'll turn it over to you and, and let you give the folks uh, so a few of the bullet items anyway of all the exciting stuff that's going on at NDA uh, since our last webinar. Absolutely, thanks Kip, I appreciate it. I apologize for that. This is very formal attire for beer and deer. Uh, so I had to throw a hat on. I was in uh, DC today. I drove down and back. I'm a little over three hours from, from the uh, nation's capital, which is good and bad. It's good because I can get out and do a meeting and come home, but it's bad because I can get out and do a meeting and come home. So uh, anyway, just getting back here and a little bit worn out from driving, but I did at least get a, get a cap on. So I uh, didn't want to miss Beer and Deer. Good to be here. Good to see everybody. See a lot of familiar names. We've got a lot of regulars on this webinar, which is great. Uh, hey, this is uh, in addition to uh, the exciting stuff going on at the at the NDA, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on for hunters right now as we get into uh, starting to prep uh, uh, those of us that are managing land, prep and food plots. Uh, antlers are starting to certainly uh, show themselves. Deer are, uh, bucks are getting to that point where you have a pretty good idea what they're going to look like this fall which is good. I'm seeing a lot of trail camera photos popping up on social media. So this is this is about the time where we, uh, if we've been a little lazy to this point, we start waking up and rising to the occasion. So, and even our topic this evening, talking about scouting is geared more toward the hunting, sort of the, the most fun part of this. And so we're excited to hear what our friend Brian has to say tonight. So just a few things from the organizational side that I'll tell you about, and then we'll go ahead and jump into the show. Uh, we have two new board members. And actually one of them is I see on here. Hi, Natalie, thanks for joining us. Uh, Natalie Krebs is one of them. Uh, she's the senior deputy, deputy editor at Outdoor Life uh, and certainly a, a friend to conservation and a really nice addition to our board. And John Anoni, uh, he's the founder of uh, Camp Compass. He also has joined our board recently. Uh, so we have two new board members. Uh, we also have two new folks working directly with our branches on fundraising and mission related ac uh, activities. So Rick Counts and James Lanier. Uh, shouldn't be a stranger to many of you have been with us in the past. They're back to help us out. And I see James is on. James, good to see you. You're a regular on here. Uh, and so back on board, which is a good thing. Uh, the last magazine, hopefully you looked it over real good because it has a sticker attached to the back of it, an NDA decal. Uh, if this is a surprise to you, run and grab your magazine and look and make sure you get it. Uh, not that you would ever pitch your magazine, but in case you did, uh, dig it out, make sure you get your sticker. And also, uh, Lindsay Thomas, the editor and our chief communications officer says, hey, tell everybody that if they still, if they join by July 20th, you can still get not only the magazine, but you'll also get the NDA sticker. And so uh, I can't imagine that not everybody on here is not already a member, but if there is that rogue possibility, you can still jump in, join, get your sticker. So please do that. Uh, at the beginning, we talked about podcasts, and uh, yeah, Brian Grossman, you're going to hear from tonight. He is the host of Deer Season 365. Uh, definitely check that out. I think a new episodes are going to come out here Wednesday. Uh, I'm the host of the Coffee and Deer show. That comes out on the following Wednesday. So what we're doing is every other week, uh, uh, Deer Season 365 and then Coffee and Deer uh, will we'll launch a new episode. Uh, check those out for sure. Those are going to be uh, continuing on for the foreseeable future. And then how to hunt deer. Uh, our friend Matt Ross, who's on here, and I think Hank is in the, uh, in the uh, room here watching today. Those fellas uh, host that show, uh, which really takes a person who's interested in deer hunting from A to Z. If you want to hunt deer, listen to that podcast. And if you, you know, most of you that are here watching this probably are already established hunters, but if you know people that aren't, please put them on to that because that's a really neat format. People can listen to that on their way to work, mowing the grass or whatever. And the guys have done a great job with it. So uh, doing a lot in the, in the uh, outreach world through the podcast, uh, check those out. Uh, mission survey, thanks to all of you that participated in that. We had nearly 3,000 people participate and we ended up giving away a life membership to Onyx Maps. Uh, Bill Butcher from Missouri was our winner there. Uh, so again, you'll see that from us on an annual basis. We appreciate you filling that out. It gives us a lot of great data and helps uh, point us in the right direction. Uh, also, uh, we've met with several new states as part of our U.S. Forest Service Master Stewardship Agreement. 
Uh, again, this is exciting. We've talked about this in the past here. This is conservation on the ground uh, led here by your national team. So uh, the more of that, the better. That's what we want to do. We want to put conservation on the ground that helps deer hunters and other species. And that's a great project that's doing it. Uh, on the policy front, I mentioned I was in DC today uh, working on a, on a chronic wasting disease issue. Uh, and we continue to do a lot with CWD. I wish we could quit talking about it, but uh, we're not going to be able to for a while. Uh, continuing to help write federal legislation for CWD that would get money to the states to help manage uh, and also encourage more research and ask for a hard look at the some of the federal policies that we feel like are lacking right now on that issue. Um, we're making a big push to support Pennsylvania Senate Bill 607, which would authorize Sunday hunting, uh, full Sunday hunting in the state. Right now, the state does three days a year, so it's kind of, um, you have to chuckle sometimes. These states that were late adopters of Sunday hunting, they have to dip their toe in the water and make sure the sky doesn't fall before they're willing to go all in. So this might be a good opportunity for hunters in the Keystone State to finally get Sunday hunting. Uh, our newest CWD Roundup is live on our website, so if you want to see everything that's going on across the country, chronic wasting de uh, disease related, check that out. Um, provides really the latest on detections, research, and policy over the last couple months. Torin Miller, uh, our policy director, he keeps that updated for us. And also on policy, our New York Hunting Hours initiative has made it to the final New York Deer Plan. Uh, so this would allow, this would bring New York up to speed. Uh, allow, allowing hunters to hunt one half hour before daylight and one half hour after sunset. And so I don't know, maybe it's something in the water between Pennsylvania and New York, but we continue to try to work with those two very big deer hunting states uh, to, for more opportunities for hunters. Uh, and finally, I'll talk about our our three work, hunter recruitment work. Uh, we've received a grant from the National Shooting Sports Foundation uh, Hunting Heritage Trust to document our field to fork in New York that we're going to do with the Nature Conservancy, Hunters of Color and the New York Department of Environmental Conservation and Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. So that's a big time partnership, people getting involved with field to fork and NSSF's given us the money to document that to show people what a great program it is. And uh, we're currently selecting candidates for the Back 40. We haven't talked about Back 40 a lot, but uh, the Back 40 property that Meat Eater donated to us. Uh, we're going to do a field to fork there, so we're selecting candidates. Uh, we're also installing on that property some new Moultrie uh, Delta cameras. Uh, that's the latest out by Moultrie. You, you, those of you that follow us on our social media, we've been sort of teasing those things. Uh, pretty exciting product. Uh, and we're also just received some new straight wall rifles from CVA and scopes from Vortex Optics to get into the hands of our, of our mentees. So uh, there's more than that going on, trust me. But those are just some of the highlights that we wanted to share with you. And as I step out of the way here and we open the floor to Brian, I just want to say, remind everybody, if you have a question, if there's something we can help you with, if there's something I can personally help you with, don't be afraid to reach out. It's just nick at deerassociation.com. Be happy to hear from you and look forward to hearing from you. So please don't be shy. All right, guys, enough for me. Back to you. All right, thanks, Nick. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our featured speaker and we'll roll right into it. Uh, tonight, we're gonna hear from Brian Grossman. Brian's the communications manager here at the National Deer Association. He's actually joined the staff in uh, 2015. So he's been with us a while. He's uh, responsible for basically amplifying NDA's educational message for hunters through many channels. Uh, everything you see that comes out on social media, Brian does. Our email newsletter that Nick just mentioned a few minutes ago that comes out every Thursday, Brian works on that. Um, our website, which has a lot on it, and, and he's really great at keeping that updated. Um, the magazine, certainly, which, which Nick mentioned, and much, much more, including the podcast that was mentioned a little earlier. Uh, Brian's been a freelanced communicator, writer, photographer, videographer um, since 2003, but he's, he's actually a trained wildlife biologist. Um, he came to NDA from the Georgia DNR Wildlife Resource Division, where he was a field operations supervisor overseeing the management of 15 WMAs or wildlife management areas. Um, no stranger to people that have been a member a long time. Um, if you're, you're seeing more from Brian with the podcast that was mentioned earlier, a lot of the, the videos that are coming out that we put out on YouTube, um, and Brian's a, a renowned public land hunter, and we're going to talk a little bit about scouting. So Brian, the floor is going to be yours. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Matt. And uh, I appreciate everybody tuning in here. Let me get my 
presentation up on the screen. Said, uh, can you see that, Matt? So, I can. That looks perfect. Okay. All right. Good deal. All right, guys. He, as, before as, you take over, let me. I say one yeah. thing that I forgot to mention is uh, everybody during the course of this, any questions that you have, put them into the Q and A, and then at the end, Matt and I will go through that Q and A and then uh, address those with with Brian. So um, <clears throat> the chat's a great feature to have fun and with each other and, and communicate. But any specific questions relative to, to Brian or the presentation tonight? Throw them in that Q and A, and then we'll make sure we address all of those at the end. So, uh, all right, G, my fault. Take it away. Uh, no problem. All right, guys. As Matt said, my name is Brian Grossman, and I'm excited to uh, be here with you guys tonight to talk a little a little deer strategy with you guys. Uh, I don't know about you, but it, there's just something about after after that Fourth of July holiday passes that uh, my mind just goes into into full deer season mode, and man, it is uh, it's going to be here before you know it. So tonight we're going to talk specifically about scouting and I'm just going to kind of walk you through um, my process of breaking down a property to, to really key in on, on the areas that I feel hold the most potential. Um, this certainly isn't the only way to scout and, and I certainly wouldn't say it's the best way, but it, it just happens to be my way and uh, just learn from a lot of trial and error over the years. And even more recently, just, just learning from uh, a lot of guys out there who are more successful at this and have more knowledge about this than I do. Uh, that's one of the, the perks of getting to host a podcast is getting to talk to talk to these folks and pick their brains and, and just learn from what they're doing. So I'm excited to be able to, to share that information with you guys here tonight. Um, I will give a, a disclaimer of sorts here. I, I'm primarily a public land hunter, as, as Matt mentioned. So a lot of my references and examples will be geared towards that. But, uh, you know, don't, if you're, a, if you're a private land hunter, don't, don't tune me out. Um, a lot of what you're going to hear here, here tonight, uh, will apply to, to private land hunting, you know, just as well. So, uh, keep that in mind. And with that, we'll go ahead and dive into, into my presentation here, uh, because I got about two hours worth of material and Kip said he's going to cut me off at 30 minutes. So we're going to, we're going to hit the high points here. Um, for me, scouting a new property starts right here, you know, in my house, at my desk, on my computer with some e-scouting or digital, digital scouting, cyber scouting, whatever you want to call it. But basically, it's just the process of, of looking at those online resources like aerial photography, topographic maps to help me find potentially good areas so that, you know, once I get out there and take time to put boots on the ground, um, I'm spending my time as efficiently as possible and not wasting a lot of time on, on unproductive areas. So that's, that's all it's for. It's certainly not a replacement for boots on the ground scouting, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, but it, it's a key part of the scouting process and, and really can uh, help you focus in on those high percentage areas. So uh, with that, the primary tools that I'm using to, to e-scout uh, first and foremost are, is Onyx. Um, I use that both on my desktop as well as on my mobile phone when I'm out in the field. Um, there's a, you know, there's a lot of mapping applications out there, but, you know, Onyx, I've used Onyx for a few years now. It, it certainly seems to be the, the most user friendly and it doesn't hurt that, that these guys are, are very big supporters of the National Deer Association. So that, that makes it a pretty easy decision. And I will give a, a quick, uh, um, just a, you could, the, we got a promo code available. So I'll give a shameless plug here is what I was trying to say for, for Onyx Maps. If you use the code NDA at onyxmaps.com, you can save 20% off the, the app. And as, as well, they'll make a, a donation back to the National Deer Association. So keep that in mind. But uh, again, primarily I'm using Onyx, but I also use the Georgia DNRs uh, has an interactive public lands map. That's, it's an online, just a website. Um, it's certainly not a replacement for Onyx, but the one thing it does give me uh, is it tells me which which roads on any particular track of public land here in Georgia are open to vehicle traffic, uh, which ones are only open to foot travel, uh, as well as any kind of maintained trails or, or paths on, on that particular track of public land. So I, I use those together with Onyx just to kind of help me come up with a game plan, um, knowing which roads are open and which ones aren't and where the trails are is a key part of being able to, 
you know, get away from the crowd, which is a big part of what we'll talk about here during this, this presentation. So um, you can check your state may or may not have something similar to that. Uh, but, but it is, uh, it, it's very handy in the e-scouting process. As far as what I'm looking for during e-scouting, well, there's, there's three main things that, that I'm focused on. And first and foremost, or I'm looking for those areas with minimal human intrusion. And, you know, that, that may seem obvious, uh, but, you know, deer, particularly mature bucks, are going to tend to gravitate towards those areas with, with the least amount of, of human pressure, of human intrusion. And so that's where I want to focus my efforts. And then within those areas, within those, those overlooked areas, I'm going to key in on favorable habitat conditions, and favorable terrain features, anything that might uh, track deer or concentrate deer movement. And, and we're gonna talk a lot more about these three key things. In fact, that's, that's most of what uh, my presentation here is gonna focus on uh, as we move forward. So as far as areas with minimal human intrusion, the, of course, the most obvious of those is, is simply places that are a long walk from any kind of vehicle access. So that's what I'm looking for looking for you know initially anything that requires a long walk and i'll add the caveat uh, particularly without trail access because what i'm what i'm finding more and more these days and and i don't have any data to back this up but it sure seems that hunters are more willing to walk further from from their vehicle now than than they have been in the past but they still have that high affinity uh for for those maintain roads and trails and and i assume that's just maybe a, a fear factor of, of getting lost or not wanting to navigate through the woods you know in the dark without some kind of some kind of trail or, or access to follow so when you're when you're e-scouting these areas don't just look at ways to get away from your vehicle make sure make sure you're getting off the beaten path as well you're getting away from those trails and and uh, any kind of foot travel roads to to really get away from, from the human intrusion. Another, another way to get away from human intrusion, of course, is by use of a boat. And uh, if you're a fan of the hunting public like I am, you've, you've undoubtedly seen them use this a lot. Uh, they, use, they use boat access frequently and, and they have a lot of success doing so. Now, I, I can't speak to this method, this method too much personally other than uh, this is my kayak here and you can see my shotgun there I, I was turkey hunting out of it when i snapped this photo but um one of my goals this this season is to carry a deer out on the back of that kayak you know using using boat access to get into an area but keep that in mind again any if if the area you're hunting has any type of water features uh, then boat access may be a way to get away from the crowd um, but you know you don't necessarily have to have a boat it may be uh, a situation where you can use hip waders or, or knee boots to get in there and, and cross a creek or a stream or or get across a swamp to a high area and, and get away from the crowd as well. So keep that again in mind. Uh, any type of water feature may allow you to get away from from a lot of the hunting pressure. Now the third one is probably the most difficult to really pick out through e scouting. Uh, it can be done, but uh, it, it's simply those overlooked areas that they're not necessarily way off the road or, or, you know, you don't have to take a boat to get to them. In some cases, they're kind of hidden in plain sight, you know, just it, it may be right off the road, but they're simply overlooked for one reason or another. And sometimes it just takes experience, you know, hunting these areas, seeing where people are parking and where the hunters are accessing to really get a feel for these overlooked spots. But you can certainly kind of get some ideas while you're while you're e-scouting it, it may simply be an access that's a little a little further away from the population centers than than other accesses on a tract of land or it could be that kind of out of the way little piece of a, of a public piece of public land um, that's away from the main block that maybe is a little harder to access or, or not as easy to pick out on a map or in the case of the photo here this is this is actually a county road that runs through a attract the public land that I hunt pretty frequently. And for a long stretch, there's no pull offs, no gates, parking access, anything like that. And even though it's not that difficult to pull off the road right here and park, uh, rarely do you ever see anybody do that. It's just 
They seem to have an affinity for those, those designated parking areas. And yet I see deer crossing here all the time, driving in and out. Um, I've actually scouted this a little bit and, and there's definitely, there's no doubt in my mind that you could get in here and, and kill a deer not very far off the road and, and uh, you know, have a nice short drag out and put some meat in the freezer. I'm not going to say you're going to go in there and kill a mature buck, but uh, there's certainly deer to, to be had in these overlooked spots, not too far off of the road. So again, keep that in mind as you're doing your e-scouting. Uh, any, any type of area that may be a little harder to get to, a little harder to pick out, to find, um, may be a spot worth looking at. So what I'm going to do, and, and it's going to depend on the size of the property, obviously, that I'm, that I'm e-scouting, but I'm going to try to pick out as many of those out of the way areas as I can find on a, on a given tract of land. So, you know, if you're hunting a hundred acres of private property, that, that may just be one little one little spot where you can get away from from anybody else hunting it um, if it's a ten thousand acre wildlife management area then obviously you're going to probably find quite a few of those those out of the way or overlooked areas but within those once i've picked those out and i've marked them on my map which i'll show you a little bit more about that here in a minute but then i'm going to start looking kind of within those out of the way spots for those favorable habitat conditions and favorable terrain features and one of the first things I'm going to look for is our transition lines or edge. And that's simply anywhere that, that two or more habitat types come together. And the more habitat kind of types coming together, the more diversity, uh, the, the better I like it. And uh, particularly, I'm looking for at least one of those types of habitat to be something, uh, some type of good cover, uh, bedding cover, particularly, is what I'm wanting to find. So... Uh, this is going to, of course, vary depending on what part of the country you're in. This is a, a again, a, this is a tract of public land here locally, but this is pretty common to what you might see here in the southeast where we have a lot of pine plantations. Man, there's a lot of edge in this photo right here, and um, I, I don't even know. I, hopefully, you guys can can see my mouse pointer there, but uh, just a lot of places you have you have young pines here in multiple places. You have hardwood drainages running through some of those pines. You have some clear cuts in here uh, from past years, um, hardwoods, just just a lot of stuff going on here. So you have a lot of habitat edge that you could you could take a look at. And again, that's I'm going to be looking within those those areas that I already designated as as out of the way or off the beaten path. Just another example here. Obviously, if you're in the Midwest, that that snapshot's going to look or that edge is going to look a whole lot different. Um, this is a tract of public land in Nebraska here. And, uh, you know, again, if you're in the Midwest, that edge may be more um, these riparian wooded strips along creeks and rivers where they meet, you know, agricultural fields or, or in the, the kind of the southwest corner here, the, the more rangeland or pasture land coming down and, and meeting that those uh, wooded strips and agricultural fields. So um, you still have edge. It's just going to look a little different. But you know, wherever you go, that's, that's something to focus on. And, uh, what I didn't mention over in the other one, the re the whole reason I'm focused on edge is because deer are creatures of edge. They, they tend to like to hang out on those edges, travel those, those edges. And so that, again, that's what I'm looking for primarily, uh, as far as habitat goes when I'm doing this map scouting. And then from there, I'm going to look, if you're in an area that has some topography, I'm going to look for favorable terrain features. And, and this could be a whole nother presentation in itself. So I, I'm just going to hit just a few little high points here as far as what I would be looking for terrain wise. But um, one of the key things, and, and you've probably heard people talk about, or maybe you hunt them yourself, but, but saddles uh, are, are one thing that always stand out to me on a topo map. And it's simply a, uh, it's a low spot between two ridges. So if you can see my pointer here, we got, we got two ridge tops and just a low spot in between the two of them. And, um, a lot of times deer are like humans. They're going to take that path of least resistance. So they're going to, they're going to tend to cross in those low spots like saddles. Um, if they're traveling from, from maybe one bottom to the other, uh, they would be more likely to cross in that saddle between the two ridges than to go over the top of the, the steepest ridge. Um, so keep an eye out for saddles. Over here on the right is an example of uh, 
what I call a crow's foot. You'll hear some people refer to it as, as maybe a, a thermal hub or a, a travel hub, but it's simply an area where multiple fingers from ridges are dumping into a single drainage. So if you can see here, uh, you know, you have the ridge here dumping into it. And just as you go around this drainage, there, there's multiple fingers all dumping into it. And a lot of times, you know, there's going to be deer trails coming off of these fingers dropping into that bottom. And at some point in there, they're going to converge in that, in that travel hub. And so those are great places to, to keep an eye out for. They can be excellent during the rut when, you know, the bucks are cruising and checking those bedding areas. So keep an eye out for those. And then just a, a, a couple more here just to touch on. Uh, any kind of funnel or pinch point, which um, sometimes it just takes boots on the ground to, to kind of pick these out, but you can certainly pick some out from, from topo maps. Uh, the example here on the left, there's some pretty steep drops between the, these ridge tops down to this creek, and it's a you know fairly significant size creek. Uh, not that deer can't cross it, but a lot of the travel will be you know parallel to the creek. And what you'll often find is here in this, uh, the more gradual slope of the, of the ridge, there may be a trail run along the bottom by the creek, uh, maybe one up, you know, mid ridge, and then an, another trail running up by the top. But as they come to that, that steep, narrow part of the, the point there, uh, those trails are going to be more likely to converge on some type of, of bench there as they cross through that pinch point, And then when they get to the other side, you know, they'll, they'll open back up and may separate in, into those, you know, the individual trails again. But uh, those are places to look for. The one here on the right, that looks to be a really steep drop down to the uh, river there. That may be more like a bluff. And I would certainly check the, the upper edge of that where it looks, looks like there's a bench running on top of that. And those deer would, you know, run that, that bench above that bluff to get from one side to the other. So uh, keep those types of areas in mind. And then the one here on the right, this is really more of a, a habitat feature than a terrain feature, but it is uh, what I would consider a, a, a funnel. And it's a, uh, uh, well, you could call it a field corner. In this case, it's it's actually a clear cut here uh, on private land. The wooded area is public land, but, you know, if the deer, say the deer were bedding in, in these pines here on this ridge, uh, if they wanted to travel over here to maybe feed in the, in these uh, oaks, rather than crossing that open clear cut or or open field, if you're you know you, if you're in a crop field situation or a hay field, uh, a lot of times, at least during daylight hours, they're more likely to drop down. You know, stay in the woods, drop down to that field corner, and cross on the outside corner there, rather than exposing themselves in that in that open area. So those, those outside corners can be good areas to look at and just see if, if there's some indication there that, that deer are kind of funneling through that area. So just keep those terrain features in mind. Now, what this all is gonna start to look like as, uh, again, this is all the part of the e-scouting process. I'm gonna be marking this stuff up on my Onyx app, you know, at my desktop before I ever get out there and put boots on the ground. And this is, just an example of what that may look like. And so the initial kind of out of the way area or overlooked area that I picked out, I've outlined here in red and the, the shape and really the size is, is fairly arbitrary. Just, just think of this as, you know, circ making a circle on an old paper map. You know, you're just, you're just circling an area that you want to focus on. And then within that area, I'm dropping pins on those or waypoints on those favorable terrain and habitat features. So what you, these white pins you see here, um, this one I dropped because there's there's multiple habitat types here converging, uh, three different three different ones right here. So I dropped a pin. Uh, this, this second one is an example of a crow's foot where you have several fingers dumping into a single drainage. Uh, down here in the bottom right is another crow's foot and that's actually the one that we just looked at on the, the topographic map. So I dropped a pin there. Again, and that pen was outside of, you know, the area that I drew in. Again, the drawing, the shape is, is just arbitrary, simply marking that, that overlooked area or an area that I'm thinking is overlooked. Uh, but then, you know, you can certainly look outside of that as you actually do your, your scouting. And then the pen on the bottom left here, uh, it's a little hard to tell here, but if you were to zoom in, that there's a, there's a saddle right there. 
and as well as a, a habitat edge. Uh, not a, not a real strong one, but it, it looks like uh, the area to the north may be a little little thinner as far as the the canopy than than to the south. And so those were places that that piqued my interest, and I dropped pins uh, within this out of the way area. That that's what it's going to look like as I get out there and put boots on the ground to actually check these spots out. So that's the next step. You're going you're gonna to work through your e-scouting. You're going to mark these multiple out-of-the-way areas on your map, um, pick out favorable habitat and terrain features within those out-of-the-way spots, and then it's time to get out there and actually you know, lay your eyes on this stuff and, and really see what's going on. Because uh, I can assure you, as I mentioned earlier, uh, e-scouting is no replacement for boots on the ground scouting and and what you're going to find is a lot of times you get out there and, and lay your eyes on this and it's not going to look exactly like you thought it would or like it did on on these aerial photos but that, that's okay uh, you know very rarely or in fact i don't know that i've ever dropped a pin on e-scouting and then went out there and and you know hung a stand right there where my pin was and killed a deer a lot of times i get out there and, and it may be a hundred yards from there, 200 yards from there before I really find what I initially had in mind and, and was looking for. Um, these are just starting points. The e-scouting is just to give you your starting points. Once I get out there and put boots on the ground, I want to check those spots I marked out, but again, that I'm not going to limit myself to those points. I'm going to check the surrounding area as well. I'm primarily looking for good cover. That, that first and foremost, I want to find good thick cover out there where I think these deer could be bedding because otherwise, you know, no matter how good the side, the other sign is, uh, whether it's a food source or buck sign, you know, if it's out in the middle of a, a wide open hardwood stand uh, with no cover, you know, anywhere in the, in the vicinity, then that's probably sign that's being made at night. And, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm going to completely mark it off, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to favor any kind of sign I can find closer to good cover. And of course here in the South, that's that, that good cover is often, you know, cut overs areas, areas that have been, that have been uh, timbered in the past, you know, not, not too far in the distant past, uh, early successional habitat, you know, old fields. It may be, uh, I've had really good luck in areas where the, the pines or hardwoods have been thinned way back and you have a really good understory, or it could be just a, a very young, thick pine stand or, you know, somewhere else uh, further, further north or, or into the Midwest, it, it may be, you know, cedars, thick cedars, old fields, that type of stuff. Um, but, but I'm always, everything else on here, the food sources, the buck sign is all going to be judged on the proximity of good cover to it. Uh, I'm going to kind of rank that stuff in my mind, uh, depending on, uh, again, how close it is to good cover. But but I am going to keep an eye out for potential food sources and, you know, not necessarily what they're feeding on right now. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm out there scouting in July, uh, it's probably not going to do me a lot of good to, to know what they're feeding on at the moment, but I'm looking at potential food sources for throughout the season. So it may be uh, for here in the southeast where I'm at, uh, you know, I'm looking at a lot of soft mass for early season, persimmons, muscadines, that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on, on uh, those oak trees, those hard mass trees for a little later in the season. Um, and, you know, uh, it might be just greenery, green vegetation for, for really late in the season. But anything, any potential food source for throughout the season, I'm going to make a note of it and I'm going to be marking it on my app uh, as I'm working my way through there. I'm also going to be looking for any kind of buck sign that, that might tell me there's a good buck in the area, uh, whether that's, you know, big tracks in a creek crossing. It could be old rubs or a, a bunch of rubs in close proximity, old scrapes, anything like that. Uh, again, I'm going to make a note of that kind of stuff. It, it's all just, you're just putting pieces of the puzzle together doesn't mean you're going to hunt over that sign, but you're just trying to, you're trying to figure these deer out, you know, figure out what they're doing. The same thing with the food sources. I'm not necessarily going to hunt right over the food source, but I'm going to note that food source is there. I'm, I'm looking for those bedding areas and then I can kind of piece together. Okay. You know, where are they traveling from? Where are they going to when, you know, how are they getting between the two, that kind of stuff. 
uh, to, to really start to come up with a game plan for, for when it's time to hunt. And then, of course, I'm always looking out for hunter sign as well. On uh, particularly, I'm you know on public land, uh, I want to know where the other hunters are. So, if I'm in an area and there's you know years of of old flagging tape tied to trees or or lines of the old uh, bright eyes thumbtacks, you know reflective thumbtacks going in and out of an area, then that's definitely I'm not going to say I'm I'm going to mark it completely off, but that's definitely going to drop it down on my priority list uh, if I can tell there's there's a good bit of of hunting activity in there. And then I just made a note here at the bottom, mark everything on Onyx. Don't worry about, you know, uh, waypoint overload, just, just mark it all. You can always delete it later, but it just, it really paints a picture to be able to tell what's going on on, on the, any given piece of property is, is to be able to look at it, look at it from above and see all those little different uh, pieces of sign that you found along the way. And this here is is kind of what a scouting trip might look like, or that I actually did get out and scout this piece for another uh, another presenta presentation that I gave. But this was kind of the end result of that scouting trip. And you can see the, the blue-green lines there are my tracks. So I turned on the tracking feature on Onyx. So I could, you know, just I'll, I do that every time I'm out there just so uh, I can see where I've been. And in this case, I can kind of see some gaps that I left that I probably should have covered there. A little better but then you also see you know i made my way around i made sure i hit where those those original white pins were that i dropped but i didn't limit myself to those i didn't just walk in check that one pin site and, and then walk back out and leave you know I, I made my way around and you can see all the pins that i dropped here along the way um, we got scrapes here we got rubs the little hiker guy here I, I dropped in there that was hunting or that was hunter activity that's where i believe i found some flagging tape in there um the little the little apples here are some kind of food source and in this case i think it was some oak trees and of course if i had my actual onyx map up here in front of me you could click on those and it would tell you exactly what it was i always make notes of of what you know what i have or or what is at that location why i dropped that pin to start with um you had an old, an old tree stand found in there. So obviously some hunter activity in there, um, bedding, just, a, again, anything that I came across that I thought was relevant. Uh, I made sure I dropped a pin there. And then the, the red outline here was just, uh, what looked to be a really nice uh, bedding area. Um, there was, a there was a lot of trails running through it. There was a lot of good cover and that was definitely a spot that, that kind of piqued my interest. And then there were some other ones here on the bottom that were really outside of my original, you know, out of the way zone there, but, but, uh, they looked pretty good. I went ahead and marked them a little closer to access and than I would typically, um, typically want to hunt, but you never know. It could be, they could be overlooked. So it, it's, it's at least an area worth checking out a little further. So that's what I'm going to boots on the ground. I'm going to continue to do this. Um, basically, and work my way around, you know, all those out of the way areas that I marked initially. And again, the, of course that number is going to be dependent on how large of an area you're actually scouting along the way, but, um, certainly get out there, put boots on the ground, check those areas out. And that's, it's an ongoing process. Um, I, I don't go out there one time and, and look every spot over that I had marked and, and call it good. Uh, I guess if it was a, a really small property, you might, but, I'm, the process is going to be ongoing. The more I learn from boots on the ground, the more I'm going to go back and, and e-scout with more information. And it's just a, it's a cycle. Um, never, I never stop scouting even throughout the season. Um, I know I'm running out of time here, man. When I, when you do find a great spot, Hey, go ahead and get everything done. That first time you're in there, um, you should be picking out a tree. Where am I going to hang my stand? Uh, how am I going to access this spot? without bumping deer on the way in and on the way out. Uh, what wind is going to work for me in here? Figure all that out while you're in there initially, and, and you won't have to be going back in in and out of there, leaving your scent and, uh, you know, lowering your odds of, of having success in there. So just be ready for that as you're doing your boots on the ground. Uh, carry cameras with you. If you're, if you're a trail camera user, carry your cameras with you. Go ahead and deploy them while you're in there, and then just stay out, basically. I mean... Uh, depending on when you're hanging them, you may, you know, you may want to go in there one time between now and, and deer season. Uh, but I would limit that, that number of times checking those to, uh, 
the lower the better. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, I'll hang one and the first time I check, it'll be when I go in there to hunt it that the very first time. So definitely take advantage of trail cameras and, uh, yeah, just again, stay out of the area till you're ready to hunt it. And, uh, always, I mean, like I said, just always be scouting, uh, even throughout the season, keep scouting, always be looking for that, that current sign, you know, don't, don't hunt on old sign don't hunt on where you think the deer should be hunt hunt where the deer are and uh, i guess i'll kind of wrap it up with that like so i know i think i've gone over my 30 minutes but uh hopefully we, we still have time for some questions absolutely good job brian very very good job and uh very nice public land buck there uh that, that you have at the end so uh um one comment i'll make though you you had the uh the kayak there and you said you He froze. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, he may come back with a question, but uh, as uh, as as Kip kind of comes unfrozen, uh, <laughs> I'll ask a quick question. Just a reminder: if you there is at least one question in the Q and A, we'll we'll address that here in a second. Um, I had a question for you. You just kind of listened to the presentation, I, and I've heard you talk about this a couple times. Once at one of our um, conventions or what to weekends in the past, what percent of those initial e-scouting locations um do you think have led to um a situation where you've you've abandoned it completely versus uh, and i'm not talking about within a couple yards even the 100 or 200 yards away versus the ones that you've ended up having a stand even if you didn't get a deer you hunted it several times i mean are, are there times that you drop a pin and then you're like you know, on the on uh, online or in the e scouting uh, on your phone, and you go out there, and it's just a waste of time. What percent do you think that is in your experience? It, it, it it's up there. I, I'd say when you initially started asking me that, I was saying, oh, probably about fifty percent, but it's it's probably more than that. I mean, really, it's it's probably sixty, seventy percent of the places. You know, you might get in there and hunt it a few times, and. Uh, or you might get out there and look boots on the ground and be like, yeah, this isn't what I thought it is at all. Yeah. Or you get out there and, and hunt it and you know, it just, it doesn't produce. And sometimes I'll completely write them off. Sometimes it just may be, you know, I just may go, go off and hunt other spots and then end up coming back to that one, you know, the next season or, or later in the season. But yeah, a lot of them just, you know, end up falling by the wayside and, and you just keep moving on. That's why I said, I'm, I'm always, uh, even these areas I've hunted now for several years, it, it's always, I'm always e-scouting. I'm always getting out there and putting boots on the ground every chance I get and just trying to learn more areas. And, and, you know, the more areas, you know, the more options you have when, when the season's in. So, yeah, I had, I had a feeling it was more than, more than half, but I mean, in my experience in the last few years, I mean, probably at least a decade, I, I've, I've had a place that I could go that I wouldn't necessarily take this approach. But in the past, um, uh, I, I did hunt a lot of public land in New England. Um, I did hunt a lot of private land in parts of the Midwest. I would take the same approach. And I felt like it was more than half. Anytime I'd be looking on on anything from a distance, once you get there, it, uh, it, it, my, I guess my point is you got to work towards it. You got to, you got to, you're going to have to put some work in. So let's look at the Q&A. Uh, hopefully Kip can rejoin us, his internet locked up. Um, there's a question from Randy. Do deer always bed in the same area or do they bed in a variety of different places? Yeah, I, of course, I, I always watch myself. I, ne I never say never or always, but um, yeah, I don't think deer, I mean, I, I think some deer probably have a high affinity for certain bedding areas to where they bed there frequently, but I don't, I don't think deer typically are going to bed in the same exact spot every single every single time you know of course they even during the day and and at night they're they're constantly they're getting up they're moving around a little bit and 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 then laying back down and so they're they're moving around as it is but but yeah i do think there's certain areas though uh, broader areas where yeah they'll tend to bed on a, on a regular basis maybe not again not the exact same beds every every day but um, the same general area yeah I, I kind of I, that just actually spurred a question in my mind and i'm reading a, the next question from um gary 
uh, I think he kind of hit it. If your spot doesn't produce early in the season, do you check it again later in the season closer to the rut? And as you're talking about general areas where deer like to bed, does that change? Do you see that changing throughout the season? Yeah, it, it definitely can change throughout the season. Um, and, and I think a lot of that, well, of course, part of it's going to be based on hunting pressure. Uh, and part of it can be on, on habitat. Um, the area where I killed that buck there at the end of the presentation, I killed that on the opening evening of deer season. And, and it's a nice, it's, it's a bedding area. It's a, it's a long ridge. That's it's pines, mature pines that have been thin way back. So there's a really nice understory in there, but as the season progresses and the leaves come off of those, the understory trees, those, all those saplings and stuff, um, they pretty much abandon that as, as a bedding area, you know, it's no longer holds the cover that they had earlier in the season. So yeah, I certainly think that that can change throughout the, throughout the deer season. I was expecting some references from, uh, from that, that hunt. <laughs> and, uh, all there we got was a picture, uh, <laughs> Ben Westfall, our colleague actually put in the, in the chat a few minutes ago, um, the deer steward habitat module link that we had mentioned early on, Ben, if you don't mind, uh, try to find that YouTube link that Brian just did on that buck. Um, that I think it was in last week's newsletter and throw that in the chat for people to watch so they can, they can watch that as well. Looking at the chat, Brian, we got a few more minutes for, for cute questions. So we're doing good. Um, Haynes asked in the chat, uh, when hoofing it deep into a spot, you found worthwhile, but it's nowhere close to a path of road. Do you have suggestions or tips if making this walk in the morning, um, if making the walk in the morning uh, in the dark, you know, what's, what's tips for those longer walks in the morning versus the evening? Do you, do you segment those for the evenings only, or will you make them in the morning? And what, what tips do you have to do that? Yeah, I'll, I'll make them in the morning or evening. And I mean, really, I, I just use that Onyx map, you know, I'll, I'll open my, my app up and, you know, for a lot of these places, I'll, I'll already have a track, you know, for that I've saved from when I walked in, you know, previously during the daylight and, you know, mark the best way in and out of these spots. And you can just follow that, you know, right to your spot using that app. And, uh, you know, it, it, I have in the past used some, um, like removable type reflectors deals, the little, uh, they're almost like a little clothespin or whatever that you can, mm. you can put them up and bring them down. But I've used those if, if there was maybe a, a some place along the trail that was, you know, maybe there was a turn or something there that might trick you up a little bit in the dark, but I, I try to stay away from marking up a spot too much like that. Cause you know, you're just attracting other hunters. Um, and, and the flagging stuff drives me crazy. I won't even get into that, but people that leave the flagging out and they don't, don't take it down. But, um, but yeah, I just mainly use the app though to navigate my way in and out. Those things have definitely, it's yeah. a game changer. Yeah. They're, they're pretty amazing. You're getting some nice compliments in here. Um, Vince mentions food sources change throughout the year. That's true. Vince. Absolutely. Um, there's another question about deer cams, um, checking them. How often are you checking them in this situation? You know, if you have them out there near your stands, uh, I check them every, around every two weeks. This gentleman mentions, is that too often? He says, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's guys that, that check their cameras regularly. I mean, I know guys that, that check your cameras regularly and still manage to, you know, kill good deer every year. So, um, I can't sit here and tell you you're wrong for checking them every two weeks. I wait a little longer than that. Um, I typically try to get mine out the first part of July, I actually got them out a little earlier this year, but I'll usually check them one time around the first of August. So I wait about a month. And then from that point, depending on what I have on there, I'll either move them or if I got a good buck in there that's showing up regularly, which was the case last year with the, the one that I showed there at the end. Um, once I seen he was in there and in there regularly, I didn't come back till opening day of deer season. Um, so I left it in, that was another month or six weeks or so. So that, that's my strategy. Again, I, I know people that check them more frequently and still find success, but I like to stay out of there. Uh, an area, if I got a good buck in there, I like to stay out of there, you know, and, and not intrude any more than I have to. True. True. Thanks Ben for putting that link to the uh, article and YouTube video in the chat. Um, Got a question here about stands from Micah. Rather than completely avoid them, have you used other hunter stands that you found activity pressure to push deer in your direction? If so, how? It's a good question, Micah. 
So when you find those areas of, of, of human presence, do you use them to your advantage? You know, I, I really ha have not. And, and that's certainly an option. And, and again, there's, there's people that do that with success, but I, I just, I typically avoid them. If I know somebody's in there hunting, um, I, I just try to avoid those areas. Uh, for one, I don't, I don't want to mess them up and you know, I don't want to have them mess me up. So, uh, I just try to, try to avoid any other, any other hunters in the area. There's certainly situations where, you know, if, if you have some type of funnel or something where those other hunters might push a deer to you, then you could take advantage of that. But I've just never, I've never found a perfect situation to, to capitalize on that on, I guess. At least having the knowledge that there might be human presence in some area will be something that you can use to your, your advantage. Oh yeah, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good. Kip is texting me and apologizing. And I think he's pulling his hair out because his computer completely froze up and it uh, uh, looks like it's updating. So it looks like I'm so oh, no. we got a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to give away a prize here in a minute. Um, one last question in the Q&A um, from Desmond. Any promo codes? This isn't necessarily for you, uh, for Jay, <laughs> but any promo codes for an NDA membership? Uh, Kip's telling me via text to tell tell the whole audience that uh, on both the uh, Deer Season 365 and the Coffee and Deer podcasts, there listen to those because we have promo codes for em membership uh, on both of those. That's so right. To push yep. you to a, another platform to to listen. So hey, that's Kip's answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I got to do what my boss tells me. So uh, go go listen to those folks if you're not in ready. You can get a promo code. So. Good job, G. Uh, we got through most of the questions. You're getting lots of compliments. Um, let's give away the prize here in a second. First, um, do join NDA if you're not a member. For everybody that's on here, Nick mentioned earlier that uh, it'd be probably a rarity for somebody to be listening to one of these things and not be a, a member. But if you are and you're not, uh, please do use that promo code. Go join. Um, please uh, uh, help us out by uh, participating in that first light sweepstakes you might be a winner of eighteen hundred dollars in prizes i don't have kip on here to, to tease me and how i'm pronouncing things so that's fine uh, you get first light gear matthew's bow uh, on x and some other great stuff uh, upcoming webinar next month august 9th uh, we have dr will gulsby from auburn university and his presentation is going to be the predator trap challenging traditional thinking on predator management for deer so if you're interested in learning a more about more about managing predators where you hunt uh, or live come on back and again that will be recorded and uh, available afterwards so uh, the prize so no, typically what I do is I listen to the presentations, just like you all do, come up with a good question. First person to type in the chat, not the Q&A. So I'm now looking at the chat feature. And the first one that comes up with this prize that types it incorrectly, I'm going to have to scroll to look, will win. And the prize is, you might have already guessed it, is a premium membership. I don't know if you can see it, to OnX. It's not coming up, but there it is. I'm going to give a one-year premium membership to Onyx to the first person that gets this. Um, here's my question. Uh, Brian defined a bunch of things through his presentation. Um, the one thing that I'm going to ask is, what do we call when you have multiple fingers from ridges dumping into a single drainage? It's a two-word answer. I see crow's foot, woo, is the answer. And we got James McMullen was the first one to put that in. Got lots of right answers here, folks. When I ask an easy one, lots of people are typing in. James, email me at matt at deerassociation.com and uh, we'll make sure we correspond through email. James McMullen, you're the winner, congratulations. I hope everybody had a great time. You learned a little bit and I hope you enjoyed yourself. So uh, thanks, G. I, had, I enjoyed it as well. Everybody Thank have you, a good evening. We'll see you at the next one. See ya.